وكذلك أوحينا إليك روحا من أمرنا ما كنت تدري ما الكتاب ولا الإيمان ولكن جعلناه نورا ولكن جعلناه نورا نهدي به من نشاء من عبادنا وإنك لتهدي إلى صراط مستقيم صراط الله الذي له ما في السماوات وما في الأرض ألا إلى الله تصير الأمور السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Welcome to Ask Huda I am your host Jimmy Rashid and I like to welcome back today Sheikh Muhammad Salah Assalamu alaikum Sheikh Alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and happy Ramadan to you and, and to the entire ummah Jazakallah Sheikh Barakallah fikum and that's it we're in Ramadan now so we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala spreads his mercy upon all of the ummah and to all our viewers Jazakallah Khair for being with us on this Ask Huda if you want to participate our telephone number country code is 202 38555 248 or 249. You can also participate by sending an SMS text message and it'll come straight through us here and we'll be entertaining those two. And if you've got an email, send your emails to ask ask at huda.tv. Sheikh, let's start with a question from Sister Saba from Canada. Um, she said that about 20 years ago, actually, she's saying that she was involved in a transaction, a monetary transaction, where there was some profit on her part, which was riba, she was saying. Um, she only knew about this now. She's learnt about it, that this is not allowed in Islam. She wants to know, how did she go back and rectify this transaction? Bismillah, walhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala nabiyihi wa mustafa, Sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wala. Praise be to Allah, we praise Him and we seek His help. Whomsoever Allah guides is the truly guided one. And whomsoever Allah leaves astray, no one can show Him guidance. I send the best, the best peace and salutation upon Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allah the Almighty, after He poses a threat against those who deal with riba, why waging a war against them? فَإِن لَمْ تَفْعَلُوا فَأَذَنُوا بِحَرْبٍ مِّنَ اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ Then He said, and if you repent, if you decide to go back to Allah, and if you repent, فَلَكُمْ رُؤُوسُ أَمْوَالِكُمْ Then one of the conditions of tawbah is you only preserve your capital sum. Then the extra, the profit, which was as a result of dealing in haram, taking an interest uh, or usury, then you should give it away. And in giving it away, there is no reward whatsoever. This is similar to a malignant humor in one's body. You just want to get rid of it by any means. Give it to any way or any person where you can just get rid of it uh, as long as it won't hurt you anymore. So if the transaction that you were involved in, that you charged interest or you deposited your money in bank or whatever, where you got a profit or an interest on that, in this condition, one of the conditions of your repentance is to get rid of this interest rate or whatever. But if it was by paying interest, then the tawbah will be sufficient and seeking Allah's forgiveness, inshallah will suffice you. And I congratulate you and every Muslim who repented to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, especially in the beginning of this blessed month of Ramadan. Jazakallah Sheikh. Okay, Sister Maryam from Oman had three questions, all linked, uh, all about divorce. The first one uh, is regarding, is there such a thing as an irreversible divorce. The second is what is an automatic divorce. And the last one, um, if her husband has been away for her, from her for many, many months, is she allowed to file for divorce from the court? Jamil, in the beginning of this episode, you said we have plenty of questions and would like to wrap them up in this episode. And now this question is uh, a series of episodes mm -hmm. by itself. Mm -hmm. It's a long subject to discuss, but briefly, a reversible divorce in Islam is known as a talaq al mm -hmm. where it's not up to the husband to return his wife again without her consent. Mm -hmm. And sometimes this bainuna or a bain, the irreversible, could be a minor or major. A minor, such if the, uh, if the husband divorces his wife once, then he waits until the idda is over, the three months or the three periods or the three ministrations. And after the third one is over and he did not return her, 
In this case, she has become totally divorced. If he's interested in marrying or remarrying her once again, that would require them both to have a new marriage contract, a new dowry, a new consent of both, ijab and qabul. Versus the, the, the reversible divorce, if he divorced her once or in the second time, and within the idda period, he has all the right to call her back into his uh, marriage life or marital life, even without her consent. And that doesn't require a new marriage contract, nor does it require a dowry. There is another example of the major irreversible divorce. If the husband divorces his wife thrice, three times, in this case, he doesn't have the right to return her, even if she agrees to that, even if it is within the idda, because she has be, has, she has become completely prohibited for him unless if Allah subhanahu, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says unless if she marries to another person a complete marriage okay not pre-arranged marriage no a complete marriage hatta tankiha zawjan ghayra then if they decided to divorce or get separated later on after her idda is over now she is lawful for the first husband if they are interested with a new marriage contract with a new dowry and they start the cycle over but it's not permissible for a person who divorced his wife three times to return her even with a new marriage contract even with a new dowry even with her consent it would require her to get married first not an arranged marriage, but a marriage, a complete marriage life, with a complete consummation of this marriage. Then if this marriage is seized for a reason or another, divorce or khula or etc., and after the idda she's free, she may, she may get remarried once again to the first one, if there is some sort of agreement. Okay, and the, and the, the last part of this question, if her husband stays away from her for several months, is she allowed to file for divorce? Not several months. The scholar said if the husband is absent for a year and uh, no information about him, the period actually is a point of difference between the scholars. Mm -hmm. The minimum is a year and he does not support the family. No, no, nobody knows where is he at. In this case, he would be sent as dead and the judge would separate them. So even if he returns, now she has the right after separation to get married to whomever she wants. So now he doesn't have the right to call her back onto him because he was absent and nobody knew where was he at. Okay, we had a question from Sister Um Khatija from the United States of America. She says her husband traveled to his home country somewhere in Africa. Um, she, he said, she said that she found her husband's family there are not praying in the mosque. And the reason why they're saying is that uh, the mosque has uh, many bad things, many bidah involved in the mosque. The mosque is very close to their house. So they do a jama'ah in the house themselves. Um, is this allowed, she's asking? Uh, the bid'ah, the sister mentioned, is vague. We don't know what kind of bid'ah. Mm -hmm. It could be something that would require ac us actually to be much involved in order to correct that. Mm -hmm. uh, withdrawing and taking aside and isolating ourselves from the society would lead to a widespread of the bid'ah. So if you recognize this as a bid'ah or innovation, you have to work hard on correcting what's fault or what's false. This is number one. Number two, it could be a major thing, an act of shirk or associating others with Allah in worship. And that happens in some of the places of worship. We've seen that in some of the masajid, where people invoke humans and ask them instead of Allah or along with Allah. In this case, I would support you and I say, you should not enter such place. So I cannot give you a straightforward answer, unless if I know what kind of bid'ah uh, uh, are being practiced in this place. Okay, Jazakallah khair. Uh, the sister's second question uh, is about teaching. She says that I've studied Tajweed and the rules and the etiquettes of how to recite the Quran properly. She wants to teach this to other sisters in America. She says we find that many sisters don't know how to recite the Quran. Uh, she's a bit apprehensive about going on to this task. She feels a bit worried. Um, what should, should you do? Some advice here. Number one, there has to be uh, a person who uh, is a reciter mm -hmm. to listen to your recitation and approve you, whether you could convey the message and teach others or not. There is a big problem with teaching while you yourself are not educated enough. This is a very, very dangerous, especially with the pronunciation of the Arabic letters. So if, uh, if you know a little bit, but you pronounce properly, and whatever you know, you practice rightly, in this condition, whatever is available is better than nothing. We say in Arabic, مَا لَا يُدْرَكُ كُلُّهُ لَا يُدْرَكُ جُلُّهُ If you cannot achieve it all, you do not leave it 
Oh, mm -hmm. so basically, first of all, we have to know what kind of uh, level of recitation that you have, and if your recitation is proper and you recite properly and the pronunciation of the letters are correct, in this case, uh, it is recommended for you to teach those who do not, who do not know at all. Because the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, بَلِّغُوا عَنِّي وَلَوْ آيَةً Everyone is required to convey the message as much as you can and as much as you know, even if it is just one verse. Jazak al khair. Okay, we had a question from Sister Suha from the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Uh, she says, I wear hijab and niqab. Uh, my parents uh, want me to remove my niqab in front of family when we have a family gathering and so forth. Uh, not the hijab, the, the niqab. Um, she wants some advice on that, Shaykh. This hukm uh, could not be divided by the meaning. We don't say, okay, before non-mahram outsiders, mm -hmm. you must cover your face. But before non-mahram at home, mm -hmm. that it's okay to uncover your face. That doesn't make any sense. That was not revealed neither in the Quran nor in the Sunnah. If you adopt a practice because you believe it is mandatory, and this is the opinion of uh, the vast majority of the scholars or whatever, then you must stick to it before everyone. As a matter of fact, the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was asked about the illa, alhamu, such mm -hmm. as the brother-in-law, for instance. He was asked, what about the illa, alhamu? And Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, alhamu al maut mm -hmm. that's equivalent to death, mm -hmm. equivalent to seeing the angel of death coming to take your soul. It's a very serious and dangerous threat. Do not overtrust this. Do not treat the hamu or the illo as your male mahram so because he is not. Uh, we've seen some people that the illo would come at home and stay alone with his sister-in-law in the absence of any male mahram, period. Sometimes they live together, especially in uh, Western countries, and they do not see anything wrong with that. It is haram. Even if nothing wrong happens, it is haram. Because the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says that if any male and a female happen to be together in one place without a mahram, then the third <coughs> should be Satan. Jazakallah khair, Shaykh. Okay, the first call of the day, Sister Aisha from the United States of America. Sister, you're live on Ask Huda. Your question, please. Sister, are you with us? Sister Aisha? Yes, I can hear you, sister. Uh, I have a question. Uh, I'm a reverse Muslim. Okay. And I have a question regarding shares. Uh, do we have to pay the cut on shares that have been invested? And if the answer is yes, then I um, have a question on how to calculate it. Uh, because I've been investing $100 a month for the last three years, but I haven't taken any money out of it or cashed it. Okay. Um, I want to know if uh, I have to pay the cut on that or okay. how to calculate it on the market value or, or the original value okay. uh, of the share. Exactly. Um, and then my second question mm -hmm. uh, is, is there, I'm currently reading the Quran uh, um, uh, Tafsir in English of Abdullah Yusufali. I wanted to know if there's another Quran um, in English that has a Tafsir in detail for each ayat. Uh, what is your recommendation? Okay. And the uh, last question is, is this the new timing of the Al-Huda show right now for, um, because today came on a different um, time. Okay. Jazakum Allah khairan. Jazakallah for those questions, Sister Aisha from the United States of America. Okay, next, uh, Sister Wafa from Egypt. Sister, you're live on Ask Your question, please. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum as salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Happy and blessed Ramadan to you all. Jazakum and to you, Allah Sister. And to you as well. Uh, please, I have a question. Um, uh, you mentioned several, several times that the prayer of the woman at home, at home is uh, superior to her prayer in the masjid. Uh, and uh, the case should be done in the masjid, if, even if it is for a little time. Uh, I know that I can go to, to the masjid and pray and do it again, but I'm looking for what is best. Okay. Okay. Uh, how can the woman attain the reward of it while she still pray at home? Okay. 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 Sister Wafa there from Egypt. Just like a sister for those questions. Okay, let's return back to some of these questions. Brother Muhammad Sheikh from the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia uh, asked a question about property. He's bought a flat. He's paying on installments for this flat. Um, he found in this contract, after reading it, after he signed the contract, that uh, if he makes a deferred payment, if he's late on a payment, he will have to pay interest on this payment. His question is, uh, should I get myself out of this contract, knowing that I've signed into it now and it's got some haram in it? Number one, definitely that contract includes riba. Mm -hmm. Because the, the fiqh rule is 
كل قرض جر نفعا فهو ربا every loan that you owe if it is accompanied at the time of payment with an increase or extra amount even if it's just a little bit even if the interest rate is just 1% or a fraction of 1% then the whole transaction is riba so that's why you should insist from the beginning that you should take off this clause from the, the contract and you commit yourself to pay on time because if you sign as an agreement to that you are involved in an agreement of dealing with riba Jazakallah <laughs> Okay, the, the brother had a second question upon the property itself. He says the people who are buying it, of the builders themselves, uh, they're willing to give me three years guaranteed rent on this property on the market. He says, am I allowed to go into a transaction like this? I think it is uh, worth of explaining to the viewers, maybe many of them do not understand the term, mm. which is if, if, if the buyer or the customer is making a down payment to buy a property that will be built in the future, mm. And the company or the builder, the, uh, the seller, offers him to rent it for him mm -hmm. for three years and mm -hmm. they make a commitment. That's perfectly fine as long as uh, there will be a property and it will be rented. So they're not committing themselves to something that uh, is not known. It is something that the builder himself will build and he's fully aware of the description, even if it is uh, the architecture. It is known. Uh, the, the space and uh, what kind of uh, building will it be so they figure out the rent and the value according to today's uh, value there is no problem with that okay we have a question from sister Risma from Oman uh, it's about Qiyam al-Layl she wants to know in sujood in Qiyam is there any prophetic sunnah to recite in the sujood we said before, and Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, this is the best position that you are nearest to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, so increase making dua. Any dua, anything that you have in your mind to ask Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. If you're asking me about the most preferable dua, of course I prefer uh, the supplications which are derived from the Qur'an. Such as Rabbana atina fi dunya hasanatan wa fi al-akhirati hasanatan wa qina azab al-nar. Brothers and sisters, you may have heard this dua from me and this verse so many times, hundreds of times. And I would keep repeating this ayah and this dua because this is the most comprehensive dua. This is the most comprehensive dua. Many of the companions such as Anas ibn Malik and others, whenever they ask them, uh, make dua for us, they say, Rabbana atina fi dunya hasanatan wa fi al-akhirati hasanatan wa qina adab al-na. So by the end of the sitting or the meeting, they ask him, he would repeat the same thing. They say, you don't know any other dua? He said, it, it didn't leave anything. I asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, give me every good in this life and give me every good in the hereafter. So our Lord give us a goodly reward in this life and a goodly reward in the hereafter. There are so many beautiful supplications in uh, the Quran. It is best to memorize them so that you invoke Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with what he taught us, such as Rabbana hablana min azwajina wa zurriyatina qurrata a'yunin wa ja'anna lil muttaqina imama. Uh, Surah Al-Furqan, this is a supplication that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala praised the servants of the most merciful, that among their virtuous and righteous deeds, that they invoke Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, our Lord, grant us, give us, from our spouses and our offspring, uh, and our offspring, comfort for our eyes, peace for our minds. Uh, and make us leaders of the pious in addition to list of supplications uh, which are derived from the Quran and prophetic invocations as well if you wish once again I recommend there is a beautiful booklet that's called the fortress of the Muslim or the citadel of the believer it's available in Arabic in Urdu in English and I'm pretty sure in other languages as well yeah. you can learn to memorize a few supplications and du'as from that I think the second question of hers is leading on from that. This dua that we're, we're making in, in our sujood, does it have to be in the Arabic language? We said in, in sujood, besides the dua which is prescribed, such as subhana rabbi al-a'la, etc., if you have a need and you don't know Arabic, you can invoke Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in your language. There is no restriction in that, and Allah knows best. Okay, we had a question from Brother Abu Hafat from Qatar. Uh, about zakah, um, he's saying he's bought some land for his children. Um, he wants to know, is this land zakatable every single year? What determines whether the property is zakatable or not is the intention of the owner. Do you preserve it or did you buy it with the intention of uh, trade, 
to make a profit, to sell it whenever the prices uh, are up. If this is your intention, this is business. Then this property is zakatable. And how do you calculate the zakat? Whenever the zakat is due every lunar year, you calculate the zakat according to today's market value. So if you bought it for 10000 and today it is worth 20000 so you pay the zakat on the 20000 And you calculate it as 2.5%. 2.5% of the value of the property as of today, the day of paying the zakat. But if you bought the property so that when your kids grow up, they can build on it a, pro uh, a building, or can divide it among themselves, it is not with the intention of trade or to sell it, then it's not zakatable no matter how many years you keep it, and no matter how much the value increases. Okay, we had a question from Sister Sabah from the United Arab Emirates uh, about medical insurance, a familiar question on Ask Her, but the sister is saying nowadays medical costs are rising, and if you're working somewhere where they don't provide any costs for medicine, for example, um, you have to go out and get medical insurance. Is that true? Number one. I would like to remind the viewers that why did we say all sort of insurance, the commercial insurance is prohibited because it involves two things. It makes you get indulged into usury and into gambling. Just a quick explanation that for instance somebody uh, signs a contract with the insurance company, life insurance for instance, that uh, upon death that they will pay his family a couple million dollars for instance. Then he only makes the first payment, then he dies. So what did he do that so that his family deserved the two million dollars? This is an example. Another is the opposite. This is gharar. This is uh, confusion. And the Prophet prohibited us from dealing with al gharar. Any confusion in selling or uh, any business transaction makes the business transaction void or invalid. So it has to be clear what you're buying. It has to be clear what you're buying and the value of what you're buying and the price of what you're paying mm -hmm. uh, and so forth. The other case is when somebody keeps paying for 10 years, then he was late for one or two payments <laughs> so they void his contract mm -hmm. and he got in a car accident or a collision and he died. What happened to the payments of the past 10 years? Gone with the wind. Mm -hmm. This is similar to gambling. You're buying something which you don't know when will it happen and how much the value which will, of what you get. In addition to this money will be deposited in the bank is not to do anything but to collect riba and interest on it. As far as those who are living in countries where there is no Islamic uh, uh, insurance, such as the social insurance, mm -hmm. uh, groups which they... Uh, have monthly subscription to provide, for instance, for the physicians, the pharmacists, the dentists, the engineers. They have a group to support those who get sick of them, those who get married, those who have a death accident or whatever. This is perfectly fine because whatever you're paying, that's called cooperation. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَتَعَاوَنُوا and cooperate with one another. وَتَعَاوَنُوا عَلَى الْبِرِّ وَالتَّقْوَى وَلَا تَعَاوَنُوا عَلَى الْإِثْمِ وَالْعُدْوَانِ But the commercial insurance, uh, according to the very vast majority of the scholars, the uh, contemporary scholars or the scholars who came before, is haram due to the previous reasons I mentioned. But those who live in countries where uh, they do not provide um, social health insurance and if you go to the hospital and you don't have health insurance they won't treat you if they go to a clinic a walking clinic and you don't have the insurance card you won't get treated and you don't have the money due to necessity the scholar said for muslims who live in such societies it is permissible to buy such insurance and allah knows best okay we had uh, a couple of questions by the mahmoud from qatar um, the first is he is speaking about the Adhan and hearing the Adhan, and especially in Ramadan, it's very important yeah. when it comes to breaking the fast. If you live in a place where you can't hear the Adhan, can you follow a timesheet, a timetable? to open Well, if you know the timesheet mm -hmm. is accurate, then that works like the Adhan, as far as when you should stop eating. Mm -hmm. uh, there is a very important notice. Most of the timesheets in, in, in America, in Europe, you'll find that there is... The, the, the time of the five daily prayers in addition to something called imsak. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And normally the imsak will be 10 to 15 minutes before Fajr. This is totally haram. 
Why? Because I impose on people to stop eating and drinking 15 minutes before the due time. While Allah the Almighty said in Surah Al-Baqarah, فَكُلُوا وَشْرَبُوا Do eat and drink. حَتَّى يَتَبَيَّنَ لَكُمُ الْخَيْطُ الْأَبْيَضُ مِنَ الْخَيْطِ الْأَسْوَدِ مِنَ الْفَجْرِ So you may eat and drink and before that have sexual contact with your spouses until it is clear to you الخيط الأبيض من الخيط الأسود الخيط الأبيض the white thread and the الخيط الأسود is the black thread so it's referring to what الخيط الأبيض or the white thread is referring to the light of the dawn mm-hmm. of the next day and الخيط الأسود the black thread is referring to the darkness of the night which mm-hmm. is passing by so that is a determining factor whether there is adhan or not so whenever it says adhan time is 5.45 that is the imsak time. It is okay personally as a mean of precaution to take a few minutes before to stop eating and drinking. But it is not compulsory. The imsak or withholding from eating, drinking, etc. during uh, fasting should begin with the adhan whenever the adhan is at, at the accurate time or whenever the time sheet is accurate. Okay, Jazakallah. I think the second question leads on from there. Uh, Sheikh, when you hear the adhan, um, how do you go about stop, uh, stopping your, your, yourself eating? I, mean, I think I just did answer that. Once you hear the mu'adhan say, you know that this is the true adhan. Hmm. Also some people like, you know, out of precaution and for security, they call adhan a few minutes earlier. This is not the right adhan. The right adhan is, حَتَّى يَتَبَيَّنَ لَكُمُ الْخَيْطُ الْأَبْيَضُ مِنَ الْخَيْطِ الْأَسْوَدِ مِنَ الْفَجْرِ and I think now with the advanced technology and astronomy, it has become very simple to determine when is sunset, when is the dawn, and when is the prayer time of each uh, prayer. Khair. Okay, the last question of the brother is regarding the Tarawi prayers. He's saying uh, if he wants to pray at night after he leaves the mosque, should he complete the witr with the imam or should he leave before the witr? I highly recommend to pray with the imam all the way until he finishes. Why is that? Because of the hadith that the Prophet ﷺ said, مَنْ صَلَّ مَعَ إِمَامِهِ حَتَّى يَنْصَرِفْ كُتِبَ لَهُ قِيَامُ لَيْلَةِ So it will be recorded for you as you have been praying throughout the entire night. قِيَامُ اللَّيْلِ If you join the imam until he finishes. So if you're planning to pray after the imam finishes, tahajjud or extra night prayer or at waqtu sahar an hour before fajr, in this condition, and Nabi Sallallahu said, La witrani fi layla. You should not pray to it in, in, in the same night. So what mm-hmm. do you do? The scholar said, you prayed the witr with the, with the imam in the first mm-hmm. place. Mm-hmm. It's okay. Even if you pray afterward, you don't have to pray another witr. That's another opinion. There is another opinion which says, you can actually join the imam all the way. Until he's praying witr, you join him. You pray the witr, then you add another rak'ah. So the witcher now of the imam and of the group has become for you sure. even. Mm-hmm. And then it's still all the witch to be offered by the end of the night to conceal and conclude your night prayer. And Allah knows best. Okay, we're going to take a short break and uh, inshallah return in a couple of minutes. Please do stay with us. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Shortly, we should be receiving the blessed month of Ramadan. This month of Ramadan is a season that a true believer in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is heart longs for this season. Because it's a season for the hearts to go back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to become purified and cleansed and to go back to a new repentance after being overcome by the life of this world and sins and disobedience. This month of Ramadan, my dear beloved viewers, we should know it's an honorable guest. It's so honorable that our Salaf al Salih, our pious predecessors, six months consecutively after this month of Ramadan, they used to pray to Allah and invocate, make invocations to Allah to accept their fast of Ramadan. And the other half of the year, our pious predecessors, they used to supplicate to Allah to give them life which is long enough to make them reach this month of Ramadan. So it's though that the life of our pious predecessors, the whole year revolved around this month of Ramadan.
man is still man, uh, mm -hmm. the same nature, the same requirements and the same uh, statistics as you see here even mm -hmm. for men and women. When it comes to managing two families, we have to be financially, they should be happy and they should be financially to be taken care of. What advice from your experience would you give the brothers who are thinking like Brother Saif? Right. And for the sisters who are thinking as well for their husband not to have a second wife? You know that you have to be righteous in your actions to the best of your ability as if you're following everything, the Sharia, the, um, the, the Sunnah according to what the Prophet did and how he acted with his wives and, and his companions and how his wives acted with him. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome back to Ask Huda. If you want to know our telephone number, it should be on your screen. I'll just repeat it for you. The country code is 202, then it's 3855-248 or 249. Our email address is ask, ask at huda.tv. Sheikh, we've got a question here from Sister Hadia from the United States of America regarding Zakat al mal mm. um, She says she's living in America, but a lot of her money, a lot of her wealth is actually in Nigeria, and that's uh, uh, where she's got her Zakatable wealth. She wants to know, um, should she distribute it in that country or where she's residing now? Generally speaking, the ruling of uh, paying the Zakat and uh, the recipients of the Zakat, the Zakat should be distributed wherever you live, wherever you're making your earning, unless... If people are self-sufficient, there is not many poor people there, many poor Muslim people there, or there is another reason that makes you uh, uh, that makes it permissible for one to transfer his zakah money. If there is another area in the Muslim world which is devastated and much in need, so I believe that it is perfectly fine for you to pay your zakah at your home country where there is many people who are desperately in need. <laughs> Okay, we've got a question here from Sister Zahra from Egypt. Uh, another question about Zakat al-Mal. I think they all come up in Ramadan time. Um, she's got a house that she's bought. She's got nine months left uh, for this house to be delivered to her, to be finished, to be built. Um, she's got all the money in the bank. She wants to know this money now. Do I pay Zakat on this money for this house? As long as the money still remains with you, and it's in your position, and it is not due to pay it right now, or within the time of paying the Zakat, then it is zakatable as well. Jazakallah khair. Okay, Um Amina from the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia asked a question uh, about some about some issues regarding itikaf. And we got we had a question from Sister Wafa here, so maybe we'll join them. Um, a lady over the age of fifty is she allowed to stay in itikaf in the haram in Mecca by herself, or does she need a mahram? The sister also said that her husband will accompany her, yeah, but he, he will accompany. take off mm -hmm. to do some his business and return back and so on. In this condition, it is perfectly okay to stay in the haram because anyway you're staying in, in Mecca and you not travel alone by yourself so staying in the haram uh, while him taking off to take care of his needs and mm -hmm. returning back is perfectly fine for you Jazakallah khair Okay, let's get this question of Sifa Wafa because it was regarding itikaf um, what's the best itikaf for a sister Sheikh? is it to go to a mosque for example the haram or like we always speak about uh, doing it in the house Akhi al-Habib my beloved brother Jamil, there is no i'tikaf at home. There is a, a false statement. Some people, it is cultural, by the way, mm -hmm. think that i'tikaf for women is at home. Mm -hmm. That's not true. One of the conditions of i'tikaf is to be offered in a masjid. In a masjid? No, a masjid where Salatul Jumu'ah or mm -hmm. the Friday prayer is offered. That's a masjid, not a small musalla or a place at work or at home where people have designated for the prayer. No, a masjid, a real masjid. That is applicable for a man or a woman. Mm -hmm. And it is recorded that the wives of the Prophet wasallam too, they used to do i'tikaf in the masjid. And they mm -hmm. did that during his life. And they did that after the Prophet wasallam passed away. But as far as your other question, which is very much related to that, Mm -hmm. That whenever we say the Prophet ﷺ said to one of his companions, a lady who came to tell him, Ya Rasulullah, I love and I enjoy praying behind you. And Nabi ﷺ said, Laqad alimtu thalik. I knew that. Yet, your prayer at home is superior 
and much better to pray with me in my masjid. We all know that one single prayer in the prophetic masjid is a thousand times better than the same prayer offered anywhere else or better than a thousand prayer offered anywhere else. Mm -hmm. Okay. But an Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said to this woman that whenever you pray at home, this prayer at home is superior for you than uh, to praying with me in the masjid. To mm -hmm. praying behind the Prophet sallallahu in his masjid. This is a sound hadith as an indication that it is highly recommended for a woman to conceal herself, to stay at home. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, وَقَرْنَا and settle at your homes. Do you understand from that it is not permissible for a woman to pray in the masjid? Never at all. It didn't say that. There is a hadith that the Prophet said in it, لا تمنعوا إماء الله المساجد. If a woman wants to go to attend the prayer in the masjid, no one should stop her. This is a hadith, that's a sound hadith as well. And the wives of the Prophet ﷺ, and the wives of the companions of the Prophet ﷺ, used to attend the prayer in the masjid in jama'ah. Not only that, the Prophet ﷺ appointed a door, one of the doors of the masjid, and said, this is the door of the ladies. So men should not enter or exit from this entry, or this exit, indicating that it was common. And the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to arrange the rows of the followers as follows. The first men, then the youngsters, then women. And there is a hadith with regards to the superiority of the first row concerning men. And the superiority of the last row concerning women. So to encourage women to stay away as much as they could from men. Even in the masjid, even in the prayer, in the congregational prayer. When does it become recommended for a woman to attend the prayer in the masjid? Whenever there is a halqa or a dars, and that will encourage you to learn. In this case, you go and you attend and also you pray, and you will earn the thawab of praying in jama'ah as well. Some sisters said that if I pray taraweeh at home, I feel lazy, I feel tired and exhausted, and sometimes I don't get to finish it. In addition to, I don't know how to recite Quran. And all the sisters in the West like to join the Taraweeh prayer in the Islamic centers because there is a halqa, there is ta'aleem, there is a congregational iftar, then it becomes recommended. So the ruling is not general and it's not absolute. If there is a great qari, a great reciter, a great imam whose voice and his recitation would make you acquire tranquility and khushu, can I go? Absolutely. Uh, your husband allows you to go and you are going to a secure place and the road is secure and you're going wearing the proper hijab, you're not wearing any perfume. I am emphasizing that if you ever go to the masjid or leave home, you should never wear perfume or fragrance, or wear any adornment, or anything that would attract uh, men who are not your mahram to look at you. Because the Nabi وسلم, warned women again is that. And he said, if a woman ever does that, she should return home and wash herself and wash off this perfume or the fragrance. And you're going to comply with the call of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you should also consider that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is never happy nor pleased with a woman who disobeys him or disobeys the command of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Brother Ahmed uh, from the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia asked a question about traveling in Ramadan. He says, if I travel to another city, um, I'm allowed to break my fast or not fast on that day. But say if I want to, it's not hardship for me. Uh, is there anything wrong with this, Sheikh? The verse is very clear. فَمَنْ كَانَ مِنْكُمْ مَرِيضًا أَوْ عَلَى فَعِدَّةٌ مِنْ أَيَامٍ أُخْرَ Two categories of people are exempted from fasting during Ramadan. Those who are sick and those who are traveling. Mm -hmm. For those who are traveling or those who are sick, if they still can afford fasting and they want to fast, fast. That's preferable. But the ruhsa, Allah's permission with regards to sickness and traveling, that you're exempted from fasting. But behold, you still have to make it up. فَعِدَّةٌ 
من أيام أخرى. Mm-hmm. Some people say I'm going to perform عمرة and the flight is only a couple of hours. And some people are traveling all the way from North America, 12 hours, to Mecca to perform Hajj. Where sometimes the fasting time will be doubled. And they insist on fasting and say, I'm not hungry. And I feel I, I can do it in this condition. They may do it. They don't have to break their fast. Only if there is a fear that they might expire, they might get deteriorated or get seriously ill because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't want you to hurt yourself. لا تلقوا بأيديكم إلى التهلكة Okay, the second question from the brother is regarding praying in Jama'ah. Say he's missed the Jama'ah prayer uh, and he's praying by himself. Is he allowed to recite in a loud voice he's asking or does it have to be a silent voice? It depends if it is one of the prayers where you recite a loud recitation such mm-hmm. as Maghrib, Isha and Fajr, then you recite uh, in a voice that you could hear yourself. But if it is a silent prayer such as Dhuhr and Asr, then you must recite silently. Okay, Sister Aisha from the United States of America called in and asked a question about shares and if they're zakatable, are saying zakatable. Um, if they are, how do you go about calculating the shares? I hope number one, the shares are in halal, lawful business. Mm-hmm. Do not include trading in anything that is prohibited, including uh, shares in Hollywood, including shares in movie makers, unless if it is an Islamic media, including shares in transactions which you know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has prohibited, such as uh, records, music, songs, and uh, beer, liquor, alcohol, or uh, cigarettes. So if the shares are lawful in technology, in real estate, whatever, then in this case, alhamdulillah, this is a lawful profit. In addition to how do you calculate the zakah? If your positions increase the three shot, which is an nisab, then and it, you maintain it more than the three shot for an annual, uh, for a lunar year, lunar year, an mm-hmm. Islamic year, then you pay the zakah on the value of all the shares you have, mm-hmm. in addition to any other positions which are prepared for trade, selling, or as means of savings, whether gold, silver, or cash. Jazakallah khair. Uh, this is the second question. It's about uh, a good tafsir, uh, a recommendable tafsir in English. She says she's reading the translation of Yusuf Ali. Uh, she wants to know a tafsir that you can recommend, which is in English, Sheikh. Number one. Let me bring to your attention, mm-hmm. there is no translation to the Qur'an, period, mm-hmm. at all. And no one can ever make a translation of the Qur'an. And you notice whenever I quote the meaning of an ayah, I say the approximate meaning of the ayah, mm-hmm. or the meaning of the ayah. I never say the translation of this verse, because translation means this is the exact meaning. That's mm-hmm. not true. Mm-hmm. There is no exact meaning but what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in this uh, language. Mm-hmm. So there is the meaning, the translation of the meaning of the Quran. And that's why I like, for instance, what they write on the cover of the Nobel uh, Quran. They, mm-hmm. they say the translation of the meaning of the Quran. That is approved. Okay? This is a good translation of the meaning of the Quran. Yusuf Ali too is a good translation of the meaning of the Quran. But the tafsir is something different. It quotes the meanings of the verse in details according to another Quranic verse or according to the hadith derived from uh, huge references such as Ibn Kathir, Al-Tabari, Al-Qurtubi and the great scholars of the interpreters of the Quran. In English, now there is a fantastic book, 10 volumes available, the abridged tafsir of Ibn Kathir and the publisher is Dar es Salaam publication. I highly recommend for every Muslim to have this book at home. It's 10 volumes. And I think it's available also in a soft copy. And by the way, you can download it from the internet, I think, for free. Yes, you can. Jazakallah khair, Shaykh. Yes, Barakallah Okay, I've got a question here from Sister Khadija. And as we're coming to Ramadan, I think it's a very poignant question. Um, she's asking about the best deed in Ramadan. That's her question. Uh, we've come to Ramadan now, Shaykh. We've, we've entered it. But what's the deed that we should attain for? What's the thing that we should be looking for and trying to catch? Uh, we did discuss this in details in the special issue on uh, Friday, mm-hmm. but briefly, 
This is a month which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala open all the doors of goodness and righteousness. Mm. There is the Umrah. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa said that performing Umrah in Ramadan is similar to performing Hajj with me, with mm -hmm. the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa There is giving iftar to a fasting person or persons because the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa said man fattara sa'iman, whoever gives an iftar uh, food for a, f a fasting person to break his fast with, he will get a reward similar to his without diminishing the reward of any of them. And of course, best of all is besides fasting and controlling your tongue. If you manage during this month to train yourself, to restrain yourself from just speaking whenever you want to say and control your tongue, you are successful indeed. You will definitely be the best graduate of this school the month of Ramadan. And Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, فَمَنْ لَمْ يَدَعْ قَوْلَ الزُّورِ وَالْعَمَلَ بِهِ فَلَيْسَ لِلَّهِ حَاجَ فِي أَنْ يَدَعْ طَعَامَهُ وَشَرَبَهُ One who does not give up uh, saying falsehood or acting falsehood, then Allah is not interested in his fasting. He's not interested in him starving and experiencing thirst because Allah doesn't want you just to experience hunger and thirst. He wants you to improve your manners. He wants you to train yourself and discipline yourself through the Quran, through uh, abstaining from lawful acts initially, such as eating and drinking and having a relationship with your spouse. Dhikrullahi uh, Azza wa Remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala much. As far as the Quran, which is the month of uh, Ramadan, is the month of the Quran. Uh, once again, I remind myself and I remind all the viewers, make a special effort to finish the Quran several times. We began tonight, we prayed Taraweeh the first night tonight. The Imam got to recite a whole juz, the first juz. So if you maintain the Taraweeh on every single night behind an Imam who's reading one para, that means you get to finish the Quran once during this month. Then as we said before and we suggested, you pray Fajr and Jama'ah, then you said you make your adhkar, the morning supplications, and you stay for 35 to 40 minutes, you get to recite another para. So this is minimum, minimum, twice you get to finish the Quran during the month of Ramadan. Ramadan is a wonderful opportunity to uh, reconcile with your friends, with your brothers, with your family members, especially your kinship. So try to uphold the ties of your kinship as of today, give them phone calls, pay them visits, uh, exchange gifts, and even if they were at fault, and Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, the best of them is the one who, who starts with a greeting as a means for reconciliation. So there are a lot of doors of goodness are opened in this month. As the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, whenever Ramadan comes, فُتِحَتْ أَبْوَابُ الْجَنَّةِ All the doors of heaven will be open wide. And all the doors of fire will be locked and Satan's will be chained. Jazakallah khashib. Okay, we've got a question here from the internet, Brother Mufradin. Um, he's asking uh, about reciting the Quran. He says, is it compulsory to be in ablution before one can recite the Quran? There are two different opinions with this regard. There's an opinion which says, touching, touching the Quran requires tahara from both the major and the minor impurities based on Allah's statement fi surat al-waqi'ah. لا يمسه إلا المطهرون that should not be touched but by the purified ones those who are pure of course it is worth mentioning that some scholars said this is not referring to the Quran and المطهرون are the angels but many of the scholars have used this verse as a reference to touch the Quran you have to be in a state of tahara but as far as reciting the Quran it does not require tahara from the minor tahara but the major the janaba, yes, everybody must be in a state of tahara from the major janaba, uh, ghusl. Uh, but reciting the Quran without having wudu is okay. But of course, if you remember and you go back to the first episode of Correct Your Citation, we spoke in details about this ahkam and specifically about the etiquette of reading and reciting the Quran. So among the etiquette of reading the Quran, is to be in a state of tahara. It is not required though. Jazakallah khair. Okay, I think we've got some to the end of our time, but I've got a last question here from the brother. If someone is uh, in salah and he's doubting whether he has ablution, so he's in the middle of his salah, what should he do, Sheikh? Okay. If he is already in the salah and he is certain, if he is certain that he voids wudu, then the salah is 
invalid and void. He has to withdraw right away. But if he is in doubt and he's not sure and he doesn't have a solid reference and he doesn't remember mm -hmm. that he went and he void his wudu, he remembers that he have wudu. But mm -hmm. he doesn't remember for sure that he void his wudu, then he's still in the state of tahara and this is among the whispers of Satan. So proceed on and continue in your prayer and do not bother. Jazakallah khair shaykh for all your answers today. Okay, well that's the end of Ask Uda today. That's all the time we have for you today. If you've got a question that you want answered, please just send it to us at ask at huda.tv. Until next time, we'll leave you with assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.